Hello, welcome to the 12th episode of Story Maps Live. My name is Liz Todd, and I am a product engineer and multimedia specialist on Esri's Story Maps team. While folks are still trickling in, I do want to remind everyone to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. We'll have a live Q&A uh, after the moderated portion of this webinar, and we want to hear all of your questions about cartography, data visualization, and storytelling. On today's Story Maps Live, I'm joined by Lisa Berry, John Nelson, and Cooper Thomas. Not only are they wonderful humans that I'm proud to call coworkers, they're incredibly talented cartographers and storytellers. Lisa is a cartographer, data scientist, and all around map nerd. With a focus on mapping demographic patterns, she mostly works with data from the US Census Bureau. In 2018, she automated American community survey demographic data into ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World so that the GIS community could quickly and easily map issues related to public policy. She uses demographic data to help identify the needs of different communities. And this method of policy mapping allows decision makers to find opportunities to intervene. John Nelson is a map maker, software experience designer and writer at Esri. He works with the Living Atlas team, creating geographic data, web experiences, moderately educational blogs and mildly instructional videos. He works in a small woodshed where we all are today in Michigan and relishes the opportunity to chat with other map folks. And Cooper is a cartographer and product designer on Esri Story Maps team. A man of many hats, figuratively and literally, Cooper spends his days and sometimes nights creating static and interactive maps, producing mapping resources and contributing to the UX UI design of ArcGIS Story Maps. His maps have found their way onto the Esri Graham Instagram feed, the front page of Reddit, and his mom's fridge. And with that intro, those intros out of the way, I'll hand it over to Cooper to get started with our moderated panel portion of this Story Maps Live. All over to you, Coop. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Liz, for that warm welcome. And thank you all for joining us today. It's such a um, privilege to have you all here. And it's such a privilege for me to be able to share this a virtual stage with such esteemed colleagues as, as Lisa and John. Um, these two really need no further introduction, but uh, both of them have been inspirations for me in my career, and I'm really excited to see where this conversation uh, takes us today. Um, just as a bit of a preamble, I do have some questions prepared, but uh, depending on how this conversation evolves, we might go a little bit off piece. So John and Lisa, be prepared for that. Um, for, Praise for the unexpected, I suppose. Uh, and I think with that out of the way, we can get right into it. Um, and for this first discussion topic, I wanna to start really big. I wanna swing for the fences. Uh, and so we know that really since time immemorial, maps have been used to tell stories. And I'm curious to hear from you, what you think it is about maps that make them such effective narrative instruments? Is it the aesthetic of the map that is sort of emotionally resonant? Is it map's ability to uh, condense and communicate a lot of information very efficiently. Curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, so John, why don't we start with you? Oh, that's too hard. I was actually going to suggest you ask Lisa <laughs> instead. <laughs> nice try. Instead. Oh, maps. You know what? Maps are just the best. Maps are different than all other forms of uh, data presentation, and they weave themselves perfectly with narration because they're inherent into our wiring. We get it, you know, uh, a little baby knows the concept of where, right? They reach for things, they have a sense for distance, you know, and they've got this much focus area, which happens to be the distance uh, to their mother's face, which I think is a beautiful thing, but they know where right away. And we're all born with this sense of where something is. Where is it? How far away is it? How can I get there? Um, how can I describe to you, Cooper, where to find this thing? And so, it's, uh, it's just so basic to us, but also there's like this weird sense of um, authority that goes with a map for good or ill, right? I mean, maps can be used for propagandist pur purposes or uh, spreading some kind of false narrative, but nonetheless, they're super effective and we're just wired to want to see them and want to understand them, uh, except for the monsters out there who don't like maps, but they're probably not here. We don't talk to those people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, on that topic, uh, I would say maps are very instinctual. I mean, 
like you said, from a very early age, we all understand them. From the beginning of time, people had to figure out how to get from place to place. Maps are at the core of human spreading around the world. And kind of on that topic, it's a common language that everyone speaks. You can hand a map to someone across the world to someone who doesn't speak the same language as you. And there will at least be a level of understanding between what you guys are seeing. And so it's something that connects us, but it also, you know, it can, it can help you get from place A to place B, but it can also reveal patterns that you may not have known. I mean, how many times have, well, I think people on this call maybe, how many times have you been on, uh, you know, you go to imagery and you just start exploring the world, right? There's something that's so, like, we're, we look gravitate towards that. What? You look for your house. Go yeah, you look, house. For, you look for your house and then you start, like, okay, well, I wonder what Paris looks like from up above. You know, I yeah. wonder what this other place I've, I haven't been. We just want to explore. We just want to go places, right? Yeah. Like nothing else, a map is personal in that regard because you exist in a place and you can kind of find your place or your places or places that you're familiar with. You can't do that with a bar chart or a scatter <laughs> plot or a spreadsheet. You know, you can find your place. So right. there's maps have both this capacity to communicate information and make that information very relevant to the viewer by helping to sort of situate or contextualize them in space. Um, but as cartographers, you also both think a lot about design and aesthetics and appearance. And I think another really powerful aspect of maps is their ability to uh, evoke some sort of emotional response through that design language. So for instance, you know, if you're map mapping temperature change or something, based on the colors and the fonts and the visual flourishes that you use, you can create a map that, you know, makes the viewer feel cold or makes the viewer feel hot. And I think that contributes to the sense of sort of immersion and, and world building that, um, that maps can, can achieve very successfully. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you see a map and you can imagine yourself in it. <clears throat> yeah, totally. And I think, you know, another thing about maps is that an individual map can really tell a story by itself. It can include, you know, the where, of course, but also the what and the why and the who of a particular phenomenon or a particular event. Um, so they can really be sort of self-contained narratives. But uh, we've seen, especially in sort of the digital age now, maps being used to complement uh, or to augment other kinds of broader multimedia narratives. And that's obviously kind of um, the way that maps integrate with, with storytelling in the context of ArcGIS story maps. Um, so I think for this next question, I want to start by, uh, by sharing a quote from uh, Shijuade Kadre, who's the director of diversity strategy at SNAP. Uh, and that quote is um, that data without storytelling just confirms our biases. And so if you present a map without any additional context or sort of narrative scaffolding to introduce that map and help frame it, um, you run the risk of potentially leading readers down the wrong path or uh, basically, again, confirming their, the biases that they bring into that map interaction. So I'm really curious to hear from both of you if you could maybe share some techniques or strategies or just kind of basic concepts that you employ when you're trying to build a narrative sort of around a map rather than just taking a completed map and plopping it into a story. How do you really create a sort of place-based narrative in which the map is really that, that, that core, that center, rather than just sort of, you know, dumping a map into your, into your finished product and calling it a day? I yeah, know that's a great question. I would say that in general, people are not good at reading maps. I mean, yes, we all can understand them, but not everyone can understand the data behind them. So there's something to be said about the fact that you ha there has to be some explanation that goes with that. Because like you said, if you just plop it in front of someone, they go, oh, well, I see X. They may not actually see X. It turns out, like I said, not everyone can really understand it. And so um, I know that when I make a map, the first question I ask is, who's my audience and can this map stand alone? Like those two questions are kind of the, the, the start of every single storytelling process. Um, and then once I kind of have gotten past those, I, I just start exploring the data. What things do I want people to see from this? You know, if you haven't spent the time to explore your data, why, why should someone else? 
And story maps give us so many tools like map actions and graphics and swipe and all these interactive things that let people play with the data. Uh, and, and, and it helps explain the data and it gives context to the data. And so it's, it, it's you, again, you, you say, can this stand alone? The answer is probably no. Uh, and so then it's really just a matter of holding someone's hand and saying, look at all these really cool things. This is why it matters. This is why it's important. And you use tools like story maps in order to tell those stories by guiding someone through it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just sitting here lost in thought. I'm kind of, uh, I was uh, thinking about the quote you just said, which is, if I remember, it, it says, uh, data without a narrative just confirms your biases. And it's interesting. And I was just thinking, I don't agree with that. I think, I think data is data and data is a, a tool for us to try to tease out understanding and, and parse what matters and what doesn't matter. I think a narrative is a, a person who has done that parsing and undertaken that quest for understanding from the data, the enormous amount of work of taking data, forming a picture out of it and saying, here's why this picture is important. Here's this picture compared to something else and giving people think some things to think about. And uh, I think I would agree with the opposite of that quote from the perspective of um, we're making a narrative. And there's a whole lot of responsibility intertwined in that, you know, data is just data, but a narrative, a narrative is our bias. You know, we can't escape bias. There's, there's no getting around it. It's got gonzo cartography. You can't escape bias in what you map. And it's up to us to do our best by that phenomenon, whether we're mapping, you know, power lines or wildfires or elevation or income levels or accessibility to food um, or bird migrations. You know, we need to look at that data and think about what's the best, most honest way to present an aspect of this data. And a narrative is a great way of doing it, but make no mistake, it's, it's, a, it's a bias, but hopefully it's a bias that reveals some element of truth um, in that data and it, and it lands in somebody's, in somebody's heart. And I'll tell you, and I'm rambling, Tell me if I'm rambling. Lisa, jump in anytime and interrupt <laughs> me. I, I think about um, a, a quote, like the death of a single person is a tragedy, but the death of a million is a statistic. I think Stalin said that. Um, the opposite of that is telling the story of like one thing, one element. And I think that's where story maps have a really great opportunity. And a narrative structure that I like to use is showing a map of larger scale things and then weaving in the story of one instance of that. So if, like, for example, a, a bird migration story. You can make a, a story map about bird migrations in general and here's where they go and here's how they move around. But I didn't connect with it emotionally. Uh, I was writing this story. I didn't connect with the data emotionally until I tracked one bird and I told the story of that one bird who happened to be an osprey named Julie who was hatched in Michigan. And uh, I found myself writing this story about you know, all these events that led up to this journey and the data that um, supports it, but also how important that one journey is. And then at the end, you can step back and say, and this happens and it's millions. It's uh, an opportunity to weave a specific example within a larger phenomenon. Sure. Yeah. I think one of the sort of principles of effective storytelling is giving readers kind of a hero to root for or sort of a specific example that emblematizes larger patterns or phenomena or, or whatever it is that you're trying to communicate in that story. Yeah. It creates that sort of emotional attachment to whatever that content is. Yeah. Right. And, and I feel, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. I want to talk now. <laughs> I, I feel like I almost do almost the opposite in that sometimes I invite my reader to, hey, go find your place. Again, to that topic of ground truthing something to what we know about the map. Um, it's like, I, my version of it is I give the full story and then I say, I invite people, hey, go to this city or zoom into your area. And then, you know, the fact that there's that search bar, anyone, everyone can type in their address. And then as soon as they see a pattern in their area, like you said, suddenly it matters because it's closer to your heart and to what you know already. And so it's not this, just this abstraction of 
data on a map and hopefully you get it and it becomes more uh, personal. Yeah, for sure. And I don't have a very good imagination. So a lot of the times the best I can do is think of an example in my life and describe that in the context of the data. So, I, and I encourage people who are making maps and writing story maps about that to put themselves into that phenomenon and describe an instance where something related to this happened to you and was important to you. You can have some, some pretty surprisingly personal anecdotes that really help drive home the, the point of your, of your story. You know, it's, not just, it's not just maps and it's not just data. Really, we're trying to illuminate something new for somebody and have it land in their heart. And the best way to do that is to, uh, in my case, like be really vulnerable and, and talk about a, a specific, for instance, from your life that illustrates it. Yeah, no, totally. I think that's, um, that again, sort of creates that emotional connection with the audience that makes these stories more impactful and more resonant. Um, I think one thing we've kind of touched on here a little bit is the balance or potentially even the tension between stories that are very sort of author driven in which the author crafts a very linear narrative and the reader just kind of follows that narrative and the stories that are more interactive and exploratory in which the author's really um, you know, engaging the reader to, to interact with the data and explore and interrogate it and, and sort of make it relevant to their own world. Uh, and I think these two different sort of approaches can be reconciled. And, and one technique that we see in a lot of stories is uh, you know, starting with kind of a linear narrative that sets up the data and then sort of concluding by inviting the reader to, to interact with that data. But I think one thing we found is that there's, you know, there's a time and a place for a static map, an image that just presents, you know, presents that data without any interactivity. And then there's a time and a place for, for interactive maps where readers can pan and zoom and, and click on features to see more information. Um, Lisa, you really work a lot in the ArcGIS Online Map Viewer uh, for creating interactive maps, and it's an incredibly powerful tool for creating these sorts of uh, sort of engaging web maps. John, your tool of choice tends to be ArcGIS Pro, where you create a lot of, of static maps and images. And so I'd love to hear from both of you, what factors influence your decision to create a static map or an interactive map within sort of the context of, of place-based storytelling? John, you first. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, well, let me, here I am scrolling. I'm looking for an example. So I do, Cooper, you're right. I do tend to use static maps and think in a, in a static image perspective first. And then I um, venture into the online version if I feel like it's really necessary. Um, I'm okay with that because. Um, if I'm telling a story, it's, it's the story. And if I want them to see something, I'm very happy just showing them a picture of what I want to see and narrating it via like a little sidecar whizzing by on the side. And um, ultimately, you know, it's not like one or the other. Lisa might do a static map here and there. I've seen her use really great uh, examples of an animated GIF embedded within a story that really walks you through something. If movement is needed, it's great. Um, I'll use an interactive version when I want somebody to um, kind of explore more open-endedly. But um, I will say, I'll, I'll couch that with, um, if you really want somebody to hear something, then you can't hide it behind the interaction. You have to come out and tell them, show them. And then if you want them to have the opportunity to explore more, then it's okay to kind of put that behind a layer of required interaction. And I'm going to attempt to share my screen you don't mind. Let's see, let me scooch all these windows all over the place. I'm gonna share my screen. Me too. And let me know if you can see uh, a story map. There it is. Okay, yep. so here's an example of that. So this talks about drought in the United States and it aggregates five years of drought uh, within a story map and it's walking the reader through different ways of kind of conceptualizing this and understanding it because there's a lot of data. Um, maybe you can show the reverse of something 
oftentimes the best map of a thing shows where it isn't. So I called this the optimist's drought map. Um, and then after I had kind of done the work of introducing a topic through static examples, then I thought I want the user to zoom around and pan or at least be able to. And as you zoom, you're seeing these examples of things popping up. And I didn't want to do this with just static examples. And story maps make it really easy to kind of swing over to a different location and slide over here and there. And as I zoom, I'm or as I scroll the wheel, I'm just shown exactly what I want the reader to see. You know, I'm not relying on them to have to find something and click it. I'm showing them if I want to show them. Um, but I can use interactive or static. So I have a question for you, John. Do you make all of these? So do you like start in pro? And then like I saw that little inset map you had in the sidecar. Do you make those things in like Photoshop? I'm curious. Oh, interesting. Yeah, good question. So this is ArcGIS Online, a web map that I embedded in the story map and then set different navigation points within um, the sidecar style of an interface. And then yes, this is uh, a screenshot I took of ArcGIS Pro and then I just kind of Photoshopped the area of interest here. I could have taken a screenshot of the web map itself. I just happened to have it in Pro and online too. And um, yeah, and actually, Lisa, that's a good point. A lot of the times people get nervous or anxious because how do I do legends in a map? Do right. we want to get into legends or should we save that for later? Maybe we should save it for later. The whole legend topic is so interesting. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's its own whole thing. Okay, I'll punt. <laughs> well, I, I think I think what's interesting is that you use such a strong connection between interactive and static. I live almost solely in interactive. And I think part of that is the nature of um, the data that I work with. So a lot of times I work with data like this one. Uh, I work with a lot of census data, as you guys know. So imagine just big old tables and you have to now turn this into something that people can relate to. Or in this example, this is air quality data at a global scale, but it's um, multi-level geographies. So we have countries, we also have administrative ones. So that'd be like states and then or you know, whatever the level is down from a country and then all the way down to uh, 50 kilometer hex bins. It's this aggregation of data. And so how many times have we started here where we go, what do I do, right? I have data on a map and now I have to turn this into something interesting. And I find this the most fun part of the storytelling because um, you know, the tools are there for you to explore. I mean, really when you say, okay, I wanna map a field, you have your option of, any of these fields to map. And then if you choose one, for example, if I'm interested in the most recent um, PM 2.5, so what's the particulate matter in the air? How much, how bad is the air quality? Um, I can dive right into that. And the software says, hey, I have all these different suggestions. And it's like, oh my gosh, I want to try every single one of these, right? I, I think this is the most exciting part. It can be daunting, but at the same time, it's like, I want to try everything right away. It says, okay, map circles. Okay. I'm seeing a pattern. I kind of see some conglomerations of circles. And then I, I, I'd say the best maps make you ask questions. I go, okay, I see circles on a map. Which areas should I care about? I'm going to try color, you know, and then you try this and you go, oh, okay. Maybe this is now a little bit more clear than it was before. I'm starting to see these patterns reveal themselves on the map. This is why I love ArcGIS Online. This interface we see on the right is called Smart Mapping. Um, I have a, a whole set of resources we'll share later. We have a bunch of tutorials on how to learn these. Uh, but in the meantime, um, sorry, I'm just so excited about maps. <laughs> We get here and we go, okay, well, so here's just the default setting, right? It told me there's some interesting patterns in these areas, but all we have to do is try things, you know, spend three or four minutes exploring. Okay, here, look, I immediately see the statistics of the data. By default, I'm seeing that this is a statistical pattern, but why should I care? Why does this matter at all? Uh, it doesn't really take long. I mean, it, it was a quick Google search. What does the World Health Organization say PM 2.5 values should be? And I mean, I Googled P2.5 
PM 2.5 values and the World Health Organization page essentially showed up and said, well, uh, PM 2.5 annual means, um, oh wow, they changed it, should be uh, five micrograms per, pu per cubic centimeter. Yesterday, this page said 10. And so it's, you know, you, you can change this so easily where with just a few clicks, I can change the story this map is telling. I can use a different ramp, a diverging color ramp to instead highlight the highest values. I can center the map on something. I can center it on five. And now all those areas in blue are over that value. Or if it was that value of 10 that I saw yesterday, it really doesn't take much to immediately tell a different story so that now everything in blue is above a different threshold. And then going back to how our brains connect to data, these colors don't make sense, right? Blue is a good thing, red is a bad thing. And in this map, it's telling us the opposite. And then we have this world of possibilities of color. And I know this can be daunting or seem scary, but my favorite part is just clicking on these, right? It's like, oh, this one kind of works. Oh, this one kind of works. Okay, but I think of PM 2.5 as dirty air, right? And then this one has brown. I'm like, yeah, this one. I feel like this one's telling my story. This one's drawing the eye towards those brown areas and you think dirty air. And it was just, what, five or six clicks and now my map actually has meaning. It's centered around something important from World Health Organization. It's now telling the narrative, but it's like, you have to start somewhere, right? And this is why I love that interactivity of maps because once you get here, you can then do things like set pop-ups because this now t continues telling that narrative. And I know that we can go on forever about making a map, right? But what this is about is that storytelling. And so you can easily throw this into a story map and give context. Well, what is PM 2.5? Here's a cool little graphic that shows what it is that helps give you an understanding that it's smaller than a piece of sand on the beach. We're now creating context that people can relate to, people can understand. And then you keep going, okay, but where does PM 2.5 come from? Again, use graphics, use things at your disposal. Like Cooper said, don't just throw a map. We're creating context, we're creating a narrative, we're creating story. Now we dive in, hey, here's this map and why it matters. But let's also zoom in and see the patterns. Let's see it at a more granular level. And let's explore why we see things. For example, in this case, the mountains are literally trapping this air. They're trapping it. And over here, all it takes to do a technique like that give you guys your first little tip of the day. If you have not used blending modes, you do not have to be a fancy, uh, what's it called? Expert in graphic design. A fancy pants. A fancy pants. You don't have to be a fancy pants. But you can explore these things. If you overlay the data with something like hill sh uh, the hillshade, the terrain, you can use something like the multiply, which literally just says multiply these two things together and show me both at the same time. So that then this narrative has extra context. And it's like, again, all of this is just a few clicks away and all it takes is just giving yourself permission to try things, right? No, one ha no one's gonna give you permission except for yourself. So go spend that five extra minutes. Anyway, this is why I love interactive maps and I love story maps and I could talk about them all day, but I'll let John talk too. I could watch you make maps and story maps all day. Your process was interesting. <laughs> because I was seeing you uh, play in them. And the word play is important because so much of what right. we do is like trying things and seeing if it works and stumbling into cool ideas and then keeping it. And then saying, I did this for this really rational reason, which we're, we're just rationalizing something because it looked cool when we stumbled right. on an accident. So much of it is exploratory. But I liked how, Lisa, you were writing a story and then you would make the map and then you would let the story inform how you then made the map and then the map informed how you built your story it was this kind of really nice woven um, method of creation I appreciated that I mean oh. but we we don't always know what our data is going to show us right you have to spend those few minutes 
saying, well, A, what does the, st- what does the data tell me? And then now weave in your own knowledge or the knowledge from a source like World Health Organization or a threshold. What's the, av- what's the average of my area? And you start weaving in this knowledge to turn data into information. Because again, this concept of plopping data, don't plop data. No data plopping. <laughs> no data plopping. You pl- plop it first. But then try to, you know, right, right. plop and then it. evolve. <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. your and then evolve. Yeah, that's the tagline for this session. Very plop few and of us are going to be the subject matter experts of the map we're making. Right. Because, you know, it's our job to make a map and tell a story. But we're not like, we're not uh, air quality science specialists, that sort of thing. We try to do our best to understand it, talk with the experts, read some things, and then do right. our best to do a visual interpretation of that. Now, Lisa, you had given some examples of color. And I want to show something that um, is kind of advocating for the static map version of story map mapping. So in this story map about Mary Edwards Walker, the only female Medal of Honor recipient, by the way, an amazing human being who inspired me a great deal. I have three daughters and I wrote this and I learned so much about her and it was um, it, it's changed the way that I father my daughters, so uh, that I'm a father to them. So here are some maps, and I happen to make these as static maps in ArcGIS Pro, but I used color, and I used this sprite graphic as a symbol of her spark in the world and how different she was and the light that she brought to wherever she went, you know, and it, it moved around through the map. This is a static map that um, can have multiple instances of itself you know you've, i've got a picture a picture and a picture and they look like they're kind of fading through each other the sort of thing and we're using elevation as like the fog of war analogy to block some of that color and i wanted to show you <clears throat> here at the end so this use of color at the very end where um you know i, I finally literally show that spark on mary's shoulder and then i talk about her life and then ultimately her death, and I use color to connote that sense of loss. Do you see what's happening? I've got a saturated map, and then I scroll to the next map, and it becomes kind of grayscale. The world's a little bit more dimmer and dull without her in it. And that sort of thing can add some real emotional gravitas to a story, whether the reader realizes what they're seeing or not. You know, it, it accompanies the narrative, and it kind of reinforces the fact um, that this is an emotional thing. Color. Color is important. So important. Well, and, and, and beyond color, you have this uncanny skill, John, to tie something through an entire story, something where it comes back, right? We saw that little sprite show up in multiple different places. And it's so subtle that you may not even notice it the first time, but then you pointed it out just then. And then it was all I could see. It was like, I saw it in every single image. And it was like, you, you managed to put it in every single part of it. And it's just small details like that, that really humanize a story. It really just, it connects it in our emotionally, but just also just in our mind, we've seen something over and over and we may not even realize it, but now we have this connection. Yeah. Thank you. And um, even if you're using interactive maps, you can use that same sort of visual mechanism with graphics that you nest in different parts of the story in a body of text. You can put it in a sidecar thing of text that's whizzing by and people will associate that graphic with what they're seeing on the map. And you can use that as a, as a a way of weaving the narrative thread throughout the whole story. Right. I think another technique that the stories that you've showed so far have, have all demonstrated is um, is basically this concept of taking a really complex map, whether that's a thematic map or whether it's you know a map that shows change over time, and deconstructing it into different views of that map, and then sort of sequentially stacking those views on top of each other one by one. Mm-hmm. Um, and this ties back into that concept of, again, instead of just dropping a very complex map, uh, straighten your story and expecting, or putting the onus on the reader to really deconstruct it, Instead, you as the author sort of walk the reader through through that map and sort of build it back up again. Uh, And this is a technique that we like to call map choreography. um, And it's something that's really easy to do in the Story Maps Builder because you can essentially create these different additive views of the map and then sort of add it up piece by piece. And I think it's really cool that 
This technique can be employed both with static maps, John, as you just demonstrated, or with interactive maps, Lisa, like you showed with the air quality maps. Um, and it's definitely a technique that, that we try to employ a lot in the stories that our team produces, but um, that I personally think is really effective at, again, deconstructing really complex data-rich um, content into something that's a little bit more accessible and that's a little bit uh, uh, exposed in more of sort of a linear narrative journey kind of way. Yeah, right. oh, yeah. so Cooper, I see, I do see some story maps that are effectively a, a collection of maps. Here, here are eight maps, I just wanna deliver them to you, like a map delivery device. That's one way of using story maps, um, but it, it can be a lot more. It can be that narrative storytelling thing where you kind of try to learn about the phenomenon that you're mapping and talk about why you're seeing what you're seeing. Introduce it first, uh, show some graphics and then show a map and then gently lead somebody through small change increments of the map. Um, some abrupt shifts can be you know, a little bit jarring and a little bit of a, too much of a, a 90 degree turn, I suppose, in a story right. setting. But uh, yeah, um, in, instead of thinking of a story map as like a, a binder clip that can just kind of collect a set of stories and deliver them to, or a set of maps and deliver them to somebody, think about ways to actually describe what you're seeing in the map to another person, be the legend. What's interesting is I have something to show on that topic just real Sweet. quick. And I think it'll lead us into that legend conversation. So back to that, that air quality map that we already saw, this was a story that talks about how air quality relates to policy. And so, you know, we've, we've introduced it above why it matters. And then we get to this map, but then it's like, well, why do I care? Right? Why? But I, I, in my head, I was like, well, I made 10 maps and I want you to see all 10 maps but I'm not gonna just plop them in, right? It's about context. Well, it turns out in 1979, this long uh, titled <laughs> agreement happened between 51 different countries. Well, who agreed to make a change? Well, this map shows who agreed to make that change. We've now set the scene. Why do we matter or why does this matter? And then it goes into, well, is it working? This map is then showing which areas have had an improvement since that agreement was made and which ones didn't. And it, I mean, look at just if you do kind of this motion real quick, you go, hey, oh, oh yeah, exactly. Oh, this is working. Maybe I have some hope. We've now created some hope. Um, and all of this was done without an actual legend. You have that option down here, but I think this kind of builds into that story. We said, well, how do you build a legend into a map so that you then don't have to have someone understand a legend? And in this case, this map simply uses words connected to color, right? It says, here's our map title, essentially. Who agreed, who agreed to make a change? And then I don't, I have the legend down here, but you don't need that because we've put it straight into the text. Well, they agreed with either a signature ratification or both. And immediately it's like, oh, I didn't have to open a legend, right? And then it moved on to this map, which said, oh, areas in blue saw an improvement. Areas in brown had a decline. It's like, we we haven't really done a lot other than attach those colors to words. We've again, humanized it to tell that narrative. And so this is, I think this example kind of like shows what we were talking about where it's like, we've now built something but we've also connected it and given reason and given purpose. And now suddenly you care, right? Maybe, I, I hope. Care. I care. <laughs> I, so the, here's how it, I cast a really skeptical eye on a legend. Sometimes a map needs a legend, especially if it's a static map. But a legend exists because you're pouring information onto a thing and you have to send it out into the world across your fingers that the recipient understands everything. And you're right. doing the best you can and give them a decoder ring to figure out what everything means. Um, but a legend is there because you can't stand next to them and tell a story. So a legend is kind of like a reluctant substitution for being there in person and telling them the story and showing them these scenes and walking them through a concept. But with a story map, you can do that. And so I'm, I'm not like uh, I'm not going to throw legends all over the place. What you can do is subtly weave a legending and a decoding in your story where needed, like these great examples that you showed where you just kind of colorize a little bit of text that describes something on the map that you want them to then look at 
and then you right. colorize another little bit of text and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. And you didn't have to have a little math problem in your visual right. that says green equals this. Well, but uh, actually someone in the chat just mentioned for the second map, a legend might be nice in addition to the colored text so that the readers may interpret it uh, the different color scale. And that, that's a good point. I'm not going to yep. say that text can solve all problems, right? It's more about, it's an option. So like in this example, I wanted to highlight the important parts of the legend because you can read that whole legend if you'd like. It was an option for you to read it. But what I wanted to do was highlight, hey, these are the areas I want your eye to look at. These are the parts, because there's a lot of colors on that map, but I want you to focus on these ones because these are the ones that matter in a certain context to the story. Yeah. And so legends 100% have their place. We need to offer them in many cases, but not all cases, right? Sometimes Lisa, I have to know. Great emphasis. I have to know. You keep saying legend. Is your cat legend, who's probably in the room with you right now, looking at you like, what? He's asleep right here staring what? at me. Okay. I can grab him at the end, I promise. It may, he must be so confused right now in his dream. He's having a fever dream where he's hearing his Lisa's name saying legend, 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 legend. <laughs> well, those are, yeah, those are really great tips about legends. And I think, again, this is another case where sort of considering your audience and their familiarity with the data and the geography might inform your decision as a storyteller and as an author. And Lisa, I really like the approach you've taken there where for maybe the casual viewer, where they really just need those sort of, you know, high level, here's where to look items, you know, the colored text is probably sufficient, but at the same time, if there is a reader that really wants to kind of dig into the data and try and understand every category, that full legend is there for them to kind of interact with as they see fit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, as we kind of shift focus now from the big conceptual ideas around cartography and, and storytelling to the more tactical, I'm curious if, if either of you have any other sort of specific tips that can take your story from, you know, a, a nine to a 10 um, or other sort of, you know, little map hacks that, that you think can really elevate or, or improve the quality of a, of a map in the context of, of place-based storytelling. I don't think John has any map tips that he's ever <laughs> given to anyone ever. <laughs> Zero. Zero. Do you have, what do, what do you got? What do, what do what I got? got? <laughs> I, I, can, I, can, I can say some. So one that I often recommend to people early and often is if you find that your um, story map is getting kind of long, like, oh my goodness, I'm really having to scroll in this editor. Uh, think about your reader. And so what I advise people to do is say, hey, wait a second, maybe the story map could be broken into three parts, introducing the topic, you know, with some uh, descriptive text, beautiful uh, images and the charts and the map, and then say, and jump on over to part two, where we talk mm -hmm. about how, why this is so important. And then jump over to part three, where we can talk about steps that we can take to mitigate this or embrace this or calls to action. So okay. consider breaking your narrative into a serialized format and just having like parts one, two, and three. I've seen some really beautiful examples of multi-part storytelling. Justin Madrone did that recently with, a, with a, a beautiful map on a very long and complex topic. And so naturally he broke it up and it, it uh, made for a, a less effortful reading experience, kind of more natural, like a chapter. That's a good tip. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think another one thinking of sort of making a story effortless to read is ensuring that your map um, doesn't really compete with the surrounding content in your story, really making sure that it's, um, you know, it has sort of a comfortable environment to live in within that story. I, I like to think of it kind of like making my bed, like I want to have a really cozy, comfortable, safe space <laughs> for me to crawl into at the end of the day. And I want the same thing for my map within a story. I don't want it you know, competing with a really bright image that that's going to siphon off some of the reader's attention. I want to ensure that the map speaks the same visual language as the other elements in my story through the fonts and the colors that it uses. Um, Absolutely. You don't want your map just sort of sticking out like a sore thumb because obviously it's not going to feel like it's integrated into that narrative and, and the reader might just gloss over it. Right. You know, it's kind of a, an uptight thing that I have when I'm making a story map. I don't like being able to see where the map ends and then the, the story text starts again. So I like to match the map background to my story map background. 
And so it's important to pick a nice theme that reflects the cartography, which should reflect the mood or the tone of your topic. Um, do, do we have time for me to show one quick example? Yeah, why not, right. John? I'll do it really quick, Cooper. Let me know if you can see this. See it. Yep. Okay, so in Story Maps, uh, you can set the back, you can set your own custom theme and have your own background color. So these are maps with the same background color as the content. You just don't know where a map ends and the story starts back up again because they're the same thing. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And it does just make it feel like so much more of kind of an integrated experience as, as you scroll through that story. Um, Right. So that's a great tip. And of course, there are lots of tools in the Story Maps Builder and in the Web Map Viewer to, um, to sort of customize the colors and the fonts to match whether you're starting with the story theme and sort of adding a map into that or whether you're starting with the map and, and sort of building a narrative and a story around that. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of sort of customization options there that we definitely encourage you to, to, to take advantage of. Right. Um, I think we have, looks like we have about 13 minutes left and we have a whole bunch of great questions here in the chat. So I well, think- um, I've got to go wash my hair, Coop. Sorry. <laughs> All right, bye, John. Thanks for joining. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, bye. Let's, uh, yeah, John or Lisa, if, uh, if it's okay with you, I think maybe we can shift over and, and try and tackle some of these questions. Sure. Yeah. Let's do it. Sounds great. Um, so let's see here, starting with this question from Scott. Uh, what do you think of the potential for location-based dynamic storytelling using hyper-local data, but distributed at scale in presentation templates on public-facing digital signage? So stories that can engage viewers for the stumble upon at a glance use case, um, you know, like broadcast, not necessarily an interactive, that tells data-driven stories about what's going on around them. That was a big question, and, and there's a lot to kind of unpack there with this idea of sort of hyper-local data, but curious if, um, yeah, either of you want to jump in. Well, super local stuff, I, I think, presents its own opportunity to provide super specific examples. And that kind of calls back to um, that notion that I was talking about before, where, you know, the reason that um, Feed the Children and other charities have you adopt a child is because you are more specifically connected to an individual. You have a very precise entry point into a good work instead of, instead of feeling like you're just kind of donating into a general fund. So I, I think inherently you have your own opportunity to find a specific example there, tell their story and show it in the context of that even hyper-local data and map. I have no idea if that even came close to answering the question. Right, and I, I think we also have some technical experts on the phone who might be interested in joining the Q&A conversation. Will had some comments to say about this one. Maybe, maybe not. Well. One, um, this is maybe a bit of a tangent, but one, uh, one tool that I like to use when I'm like planning a trip maybe is to go onto the snap map, which is that global interactive map of everyone that's posting photos and videos to Snapchat. And you can drill into a very specific location and see exactly what, what's kind of going on there. And I think it's a great way to, to sort of get the pulse of a, of a town or a city or, or an entire country maybe. Um, and so I think I like to think about different ways in which that kind of hyper-local information could be exposed at a more sort of at a glance, um, you know, or, or, you know, yeah, sort of just on the fly stumble upon kind of experience. And I think that social media platforms are sort of moving in that, in that direction and, and trying to explore and exploit other ways in which we can make sort of information very specific to the audience that's looking at them in both like a, you know, in a, in a, in a spatial context, which is pretty cool. Um, cool. Well, Scott, I hope that kind of answers your question a little bit, or at least gives you some food for thought. It's a great question, and I think, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of potential to take that in different directions. Um, moving on to the next question here from Heather, uh, what is a way to make very technical data interesting? 
I work for a small local government and my maps are functional, but not necessarily interesting. Great question. I think this kind of loops back to kind of what I was showing. Like I said, I work with a lot of census data where it's like, okay, you can easily make a natural breaks choropleth map of any topic in your map in your data, or you can use tools like smart mapping and try things like a relationship map, a color and size map, a dot density map. And all these things are kind of like I showed earlier, it's one click away to just try it real quick. And so what I would recommend with this one, it's, know your technical topic obviously first and choose that but then just spend again that five minutes exploring just try different things try the different styles try combining different styles and then the one other tip is try combining it with another attribute because styles like color uh, and size and relationship and dot density the point is to compare two different things so ask yourself questions of the data ask well, what two things might be related? What two things might be interesting to compare and just kind of start down this rabbit hole. I know that's not the right term, but uh, again, spend five, 10 minutes trying things. Um, like, we, like I said earlier, give yourself permission to get creative with it because you'd be surprised at how people react to maps that are beyond those boring normal ones that we, can, we see so often. It's like, spend that five minutes, try things. That's my best advice on that because I work with it all the time. <laughs> and I think of this too. Interesting is so relative. You know, um, if you're working in the GIS department and you need to make a map of all the sewer lines in the district and you're giving that to somebody, I'll tell you, the person reading that map is reading it not because they're just kind of strolling around and they're like, I'm going to check out a map of, I mean, it has to do with their job. And I'll tell you, they are very interested in knowing where the sewer lines are, where the catch basins are, or where the light posts are located. That's interesting to them. And I, I think sometimes we can think, wow, it doesn't look fancy enough. Um, I, I don't think that's where interest lies. Everything is interesting. And even if it's something that we think is really pedestrian or, or kind of blah, the audience that you're making it for, you know, if, if you're making it for that audience, they're going to eat it up. They love it. You know, they, they definitely need to know which roads have not been plowed. It doesn't have to kind of look very bright or big, uh, visually saturated or something. The, the topic itself can drive interest. And our job as making maps is kind of understanding that phenomenon, whether it's plowed versus unplowed roads in the wintertime and presenting that as simply and cleanly as possible. And that drives engagement. Awesome. Yeah, those are great, great answers. Um, okay, here's uh, the next one. This one's kind of a, a fun technical one. This one comes from Damien. Can you please advise on the best way to create interactive maps within a story map that are not Web Mercator? A lot of my data is best shown in a polar projection. Well, to my knowledge, the best way to create a, a web map that's not using Web Mercator is if the very first layer that you add to that web map uses a different projection or coordinate system, that will automatically change the web map to use that, the entire web map to use that coordinate system. And if you then add any additional feature layers on top of that web map, they should be reprojected on the fly to match. Mm -hmm. Um, and just yesterday, uh, Story Maps added the ability to create a map tour block in non Web Mercator projections as well. So if you pull in a web map that uses a polar projection in that map tour block, it should render as expected in that polar projection, which is pretty cool. Oh, Did I get that right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's awesome. There's, I mean, you can also create a custom um, base map, a custom vector tile base map in any projection that you'd like. And then it'll do that kind of same thing. It'll it'll change to the projection of your base map. So you create it, you know, essentially take any country's layer, make a, you know, a vector tile base map at it, throw it behind your map, then throw everything else else you want on top of that. That also will accomplish the same thing. A little more hacky though. <laughs> yeah, and um, so Lisa and I both work on the Living Atlas team, and there's plenty of. Um, options, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say plenty of, but there are options in Living Atlas where you can pull in a base map that is designed for Arctic or Antarctic. Like if you go to Living Atlas, ArcGIS or livingatlas.arcgis.com, you can type polar and you'll see some polar base maps that you can 
fire up and then any sort of vector features that you pour into that should reproject on the fly for you. I mean, projections are, they are tricky. And like Lisa said, if you are working in pro, you can use whatever projection you want and then upload the, export the map as a tiled map and um, ArcGIS Online will likely support that. I can paste a link of, uh, let me see this. It was written by Jonah Adkins wrote a, a, a guest blog post about making your own projection in ArcGIS Pro or picking your own projection in ArcGIS Pro and then um, exporting it. Let me look for a link. And there are a number of, John, you've actually published a number of vector tile based maps to the Living Atlas that use non conventional projections, right? There's an Equal Earth one, which is a new kind of cool uh, conformal projection. Um, I think there's at least one or two uh, polar projection based maps that are available in the Living Atlas as well. So if you start your web map using one of those, any additional feature layers should automatically kind of yeah. uh, reposition themselves to match. Mm -hmm. There's even one for Spillhouse, a Spillhouse projection on, in a web map. Spillhouse is a really fun projection. Shows all the world's oceans as they actually are, one big interconnected blob of water. Check that out, Spillhouse. Spillhouse. Um, okay, we have just a couple minutes left here, so I think we're gonna try and get one more question in before we wrap things up. Um, we didn't get your question, so sorry. We just tend to get carried away as we talk about mapping and storytelling, but we'll do our best to respond to those in the chat or connect with you directly. Um, the last question I wanna ask here is from Kara or Kara. Um, thanks so much for this question. I wanna practice making some story maps, but I don't have any projects I'm really invested in or data I can collect in myself. Do you have any advice for finding data sets to practice creating uh, stories? Again, on John's topic, we work for the Living Atlas team. The Living Atlas is literally a collection of authoritative data. And instead of seeing every map that was made by every GIS person ever, Living Atlas narrows it down by different topics, by different categories, and helps you kind of browse, search, and explore different interesting things, uh, different geospatial data sets. And so uh, I believe they gave you a link in there, but it, yeah, like, John said, livingatlas.arcgis.com, and then go ham. <laughs> yeah, I'll second that. And then um, I know a, a resource that Cooper and I like to use is Natural Earth. So Natural mm -hmm. Earth is a free open source collection of data that you can use to build some of the basic building blocks of a new map, like coastlines and some hill shade or states and country borders and that kind of thing, just to get going. Yeah, Natural Earth is great. It's also, I think, in the public domains, so you're free to use that data without any sort of licensing restrictions or anything. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, but it's a volunteer, I think, primarily volunteer run project. So, uh, yeah, we like to shout them out whenever we can. Um, I think one more sort of similar resource that's really cool is called Project Linework, which is a collection of uh, similar base layers that are rendered in more sort of creative. Uh, creative ways, so maybe generalized really aggressively so they look very hand-drawn or, you know, drawn to look like the hexagons that you'd see on a traditional sort of, you know, tactical board game. Uh, check that out as well, Project Linework. It's a great resource. Yeah, I use uh, Moriarty Hand from Project Linework and maybe half my maps. And it makes a really good um, small map for an overview shape, because a lot of the times the data we're working with in overview maps is really detailed and it shows all these nuanced islands and overly complicated coastlines, and it looks kind of chunky. But um, Moriarty Hand from Project Line Work is just a nice, smooth, basic, almost cartoon-like um, rep representation of, of land areas, and it's great for overview maps and globes. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for all of your questions and, and our apologies if you didn't have a chance to get to it. Um, before we sign off, Lisa or John, I'm curious if either of you have anything you'd like to plug, a blog or a you know, website, or maybe you've released a new album. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. I'll get Legend real quick while John answers. Yeah, yeah let's see Legend. Um, I can... Oh. I can... <laughs> oh, there he is. You didn't... Oh, look at him. There he is, Legend. Continue. What a legend. I'll, I'll plug the cartography MOOC. So uh, a MOOC is a great big 
free online course and the topic is cartography. It was put together and coordinated by Ken Field and I'll join him in lessons from time to time in that. And it's a lot of fun and it's available. It starts, it's uh, available again this um, February. So in February, it's a six week class, totally free. You get all the software for free while you're using it. Plus a few weeks grace period after that to try it out. It's a good way to try out pro if you're unfamiliar and talks about different cartographic techniques. So cartography MOOC, if you haven't tried it, give it a look. There's also the cartography course created by Heather Smith. Um, yes. That thing is awesome. And I think it actually touched on some topics that um, people asked in the Q and A kind of, where do people get um, cartographic re uh, resources to get started? If you have not checked out the MOOC or Heather Smith's uh, cartography course, they are an incredible place to start. Yeah, I'll paste the link to the MOOC and- Sorry, my on. hands are a little full. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> so I'm gonna Google Heather Smith cartography and hopefully John, find I'm in gonna time throw the link to the MOOC in the chat. Thank you. Okay, somebody's gonna throw that in there. Cool, and well, yeah, while you're sharing those links, I'd also just like to uh, shout out the Story Maps website. Even if you're not creating stories in Story Maps, um, there's a whole host of really valuable resources on principles of storytelling, uh, principles of thematic and reference cartography and how you can kind of marry the two, including a few uh, really excellent articles by our own Alan Carroll, the founder of the Story Maps team is here today. Um, that kind of provides some, some bigger context around some of the topics that we've, we've discussed today. So uh, be sure to check that out as well. Oh, and I've just pasted the link to Heather's course as well. So the cartography MOOC link is there and Heather's course is there. So many resources for making fun and engaging cartography. Yes, incredible resources. This was an incredible episode of Story Maps Live. Thank you so much, Lisa, Coop, and John. We appreciate your time and your expertise here. Um, and we will try and get back to the folks whose questions we didn't get to another, another time. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Thanks, everybody.